I think it's so I I just fret when I watch adults negative coaching experiences and screaming and yelling and we did a uh, we did a tour years back. We went to Hockey Hall of Fame with uh, I think it was a I think it was a Pee Wee team at that point. We were coaching all the parents and we toured Maple Leaf Gardens. And one of the things that they spoke about is they said, we let youth teams come in here and play so they could experience Maple Leaf Gardens. And they said, the only rule we have is there are no parents allowed. There's the coach and the kids and they played and that was it. So I thought that was interesting. And that was a good 25, 26 years ago where even then they knew that it should be about the kids and we don't even want, they didn't even want the parents in the building, which I thought was interesting. There are leagues in uh, Quebec where parents aren't allowed in buildings at youth, competitive youth games. <laughs> right, which is so disappointing, right? And in soccer, they have a parent that wears an armband that's the ethical watchdog. Just the fact they wear it, they're there to monitor and look at your behavior and your actions. And, you know, you saw the pictures that Mike posted yesterday. Yeah. Picture of adults fighting at a baseball game. And um, that's happening. Like, it's it's really happening. So yeah. I think we're doing some pretty good things and making a difference. And, Boy, I, I really want to thank uh, both of you for hanging in there this long. Uh, no, it was, good. it was a good talk. Thank you. I'm uh, glad that you got to meet Al, and I hope you guys connect further in, in what you're doing. And Peter, I think you're going to be a guy who's going to experiment with that mission statement exercise. And I would strongly recommend, Al, for me and for Peter, you put together a Sort of the details of what you have to do for a good social for your association. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, and you yeah. I'm definitely going to get together with a, that local president that I know, and if nothing else, I want to find out when they're going to do their next coaches meeting and see if I can just sit there and attend and kind of be a fly on the wall to see what's going on exactly. See, right now we're too late to make that difference. Al had the timing down. They right. Started yet? Oh, I don't know, Wally. I think it, I think I think you can, you can start this at any time. I mean, obviously, you want to start the season off, right? But I, you know, I mean, if uh, if things have already started off and you have that conversation, especially, you know, it's better late than better to do it now than to not do it. You know. So would you do yeah. the social even after the season starts if you didn't do it? See, you, you can't get everybody together, is what I'm saying. It is hard. It's harder now that the season's started, right? Because now, every, like all the teams are on the ice, you got games going on, on the weekend. That's it's definitely, and all the volunteers are busy, right? Because everybody's coaching multiple teams and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, like I don't see any harm in it. I mean, oh no, you got to do it whenever you've got time to do it. My point is, we have to, Peter, next season, prepare to be doing it at the right time, and the social be a part of that. And following that, the coaches learning the exercise and experimenting with gathering the feedback from parents and players. Yeah, I mean, for for here, like with us, like in Connecticut, like the timing seems to be everything. In your town organizations, it seems like once you get to the end of the season, people are on to lacrosse, baseball, soccer, whatever the other sports are, and they don't even want to know about it. And then they want their vacations. So it seems like it's, you've got this window from the end of August to like the first, maybe second week of September when you could actually do this. But like, like Al was saying, I mean, you know, if you don't, you know, again, if you don't ask the question, the answer is always no. So. Yeah. And that, that's the window when we did it, Peter. I mean, we, we got, we tried to do the coaches meeting in that window. We tried to do this this thing here because we our ice contract starts about the 15th of august and it, 
the games start about the 15th of September. So you got a little bit of a window there when guys are starting to get engaged with hockey again. Yeah. But it's not so busy that it's too busy to do something like that. Yep. Same window. Yeah. Well, Al, I don't know if you can find time, but when you get to the level that you're not involved anymore uh, in your community, I think a spreadsheet of how to the details of what you did, the, the number of different games you had, the coaches running them, and the barbecue pits. Did you bring in any vendors, or yeah. it was a, it was affordable? Just the socialization that occurred between all the kids and the parents. Yeah, you've got trust. Respect. Yeah. Well, and like you said, well, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm never going to totally step out. I don't think I want to be in, I, I want to continue to be involved in community, community hockey. Right. But, you know, this year has definitely been, it's definitely been a big step back and, and I'm you know, not, it, it's tough to be in two places at once, for yeah. one, right. And it's tough to be a hockey director when I have to prioritize my other team, because one team I, I'm a head coach and the other team, you know, I'm just kind of helping out on. Right. So. I have to be in, I have to prioritize one a little bit over the other. And I, I'm quite upfront with everybody about that before the, you know, at the end of last season. Because last year was my first time experimenting with this and, and having, you know, two different, being in two different places. But Well, you're a hockey director yeah. of a, an age group? No, of the association. Of the association. Hockey coaching director for the association at one. And then I coached at 10 youth, uh, 2012 team. I tell you, you weren't on when Tim Bothwell said everybody has a technical director and they're more into the practice plans like Mike Benelli and the drills and the games. He said they need an ethical director. Now you have both. You have both because of that exercise. Well, we're we're trying to, but again, you know, it's. I think I think what we've found is, and I honestly, I think a lot of it goes back to what we did, like starting it off with our with our youngest group, our Debo group, right? And all the guys that there's a, a group of people that started off together in that in that group that were very aligned in the way we were thinking, and those people have continued to be involved very heavily, either as head coaches or as age level coordinators. So now they're they're take their influence in the next group of people that's coming in. You know, and, and that's, that was the whole idea was to build it that way so that, you know, if, it, if there's a few people that are doing stuff to influence the next group of people coming in behind them and influence the next group of people coming in behind them, to give them the processes to try and, you know, to keep things moving in the right direction and not just moving in the right direction, but building on it and it's making it better. Starts from the bottom and works its way up. Yeah. So that's, so now we're, now some of those people that started in that youngest group are now up to, you know, second year Pee Wee, first year Bantam. So it's now sort of permeated through the whole association. That's why I'm strongly recommended to Hockey Canada and Hockey USA. They create ethical coaching modules at every level related to this, because that's what you've done. You've created the mindset. You recruit good parents to be on the board that grow with the program, starting when they're kids. And get everybody on the same page it will grow itself so the mind's quality but i think more important than that i think you got to have some I, I think the thing that really that has really made it work is the fact that the guys are on the ice together a lot okay. and you're not on an island if you're coaching the team there you're not on an island there's like you go to practice there's going to be 12 other guys on the ice with you and you're going to have a chance to talk with them and you're going to have a chance to listen to them you're going to have a chance to you know, do a station with a coach on another team. You know, you've got uh, hopefully somebody who's really knowledgeable, who's setting up the practice plan that way. But there's, um, you know, you're. It's hard to it's hard to explain. You know what I mean? But when I go to the other association, everybody's on an island. Like at my club association, like I'm on an island on my team. Never interact with any of the other coaches other than passing in the hallway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the town association where you go to the rink and, you know, you're 
talking to 10 different guys before you get on the ice about what happened this week, what happened this weekend, you know, what's going on with the kids. Like, you know, it's just, there's so much more interaction between the coaches on a yeah. personal level, as well as a hockey level. And I think that's the difference maker. Now, I want to share this with you and with Peter. Um, before COVID, I worked with a young company out in a community of 20,000 people, um, mentoring them, but as a paid person. And I, it was called P3, uh, the middle P word. It was all about passion, power, and performance. I talked them into changing the word power to perspective. And I introduced the mission state, you know, the importance of the mission statement exercise. Well, in that community, we got a contract with four, uh, we w worked with four different communities in Alberta at the, the U8 uh, and U10 levels. That level of coaching, which is your first level back then. And we created a model of three teams on the ice and splitting them into three skill groups and going through their stations together. And one station was the boring one, the skill station. And you don't exceed 12 minutes there. Middle station was a compete station, all one versus one races, battles, competes. And the other station was just a game station. And that game station, just visualize this, Peter, I would do it at any level. You line up the players, you've got your Eagles together, your best kids, because the Hawks are together, the middle kids and the Falcons or the Pigeons are together. And they're at the game end. Now, what coaches do, Al and Peter, they throw out a puck and they play five on five because there's like, that's it, one puck. So we developed this coach with the pucks in the middle of the blue line, the line the players lined up beside them, the Eagles, but in rank order of compete. And you dump one puck in. You let the scrimmage go and you dump a second in. And they got to know which way they're shooting. And eventually you got five one on ones. If you score, they change, do one on ones. So you just dump pucks. And we've taken it to the next level where now it's two two on twos at once. And we translated into working on a breakout with coaches in the corner of the cross ice. If you stole a puck, you had to pass it to your coaches behind the, the uh, board side goal, uh, goal and breakout, providing low support with timing. But we developed that, like you said, the coaches have the plans and they talk before about what they're doing and they mix themselves up to work at the stations and the kids are all mixed up. The parents are the totally happy with it. Yeah. So that concept of numbers, practicing with two or three teams. Um, I had a midget AAA team coach he just had one team, but he still used three skill groups and three stations. Not the whole practice. And his his warm up was a little different, and his games at the end were a little bit different, but not the three cross ice things. So when they played those three station games, weaker kids were against your weaker and. You could see it. So the best kids got to develop at their level. And when they played, did all the drills, it was mixed. So interesting concept. But now that, you know, we don't have those contracts, they're back to square one. And they might be standing in line and 
waiting for a turn to touch a puck. So anyway, well, listen, you guys, it's just about two hours here. I'm going to have to sign off and uh, do some editing from last week's video. I've got about 30 minutes left to go through. And uh, last week I thought, oh, geez, we didn't really cover anything. But then, Peter, I started listening to it. It's loaded, like just like this session is loaded with good information. So I'll uh, 